Today we're going to be talking about, this is Realm Week, so we're going to be talking about synchronization in Realm. So what I want to do to start off is to look at some of the synchronization primitives that you know clients use in Realm um, and how they're implemented. Uh, and then eventually we will trend, migrate down the stack and talk about how Realm actually implements its own mutexes and, and stuff like that to even implement some of these, these higher level user level synchronization primitives. Okay, so synchronization in Realm is interesting because you know, Realm is a asynchronous, you know, uh, execution model, right? And so most things that do synchronization, like locks and, and sim fours and stuff like that, they all tend to block when you don't get the lock or don't get the sim four uh, and so forth. But in Realm, uh, as with everything in Realm, uh, our, our synchronization primitives are all asynchronous, right? So uh, in, in our case, our synchronization primitives for users are called reservations, right? And reservations have an acquire method, right? that you can ask for an event precondition. Don't try to take the reservation until this event triggers. And then you can, when you when you actually get the lock, you, you get back an event, right? That says when you've actually got the reservation and then when that event triggers, you've actually got it, right? So this acquire method is non-blocking. It gives you back an event when you've actually acquired the, the reservation. And you can do things like read or write or locks by setting this exclusive flag. And you can even have different modes on taking the reservation uh, and so forth. And then there's, you know, equivalent uh, try acquires and, there are release methods, and again, you can defer your releases on event preconditions um, and stuff like that, right? And so that that makes it possible to have have reservations that work, you know, in an asynchronous setting. And importantly, you know, these reservations, like everything else in in Realm, right, are global. So you can acquire a reservation from any node uh, on the system, right? So this reservation uh, has an ID, just like the IDs that we've seen in other other stuff and other primitives in Realm, and it can be globally referred to. Uh, on top of on top of um, uh, like from any any other possible node in the system, right? So you can have multiple nodes trying to acquire the same reservation uh, at the same time, um, and so that's something to to keep in mind when we go look at this this implementation. So we're gonna look at this this reservation implementation, and then we'll come back and look at these uh, these fast reservations that are down here. Okay, so. Reservation, just like most things in Realm, has a reservation impl uh, class. This is in the reservation impl header file, right? And so this reservation impl, right? Uh, you can actually look it up the same the same way that you look up events and stuff uh, inside the local runtime, right? You can look up your reservation handle and get back one of these reserva a pointer to one of these reservation impls. I'm not going to show you that code. You guys can go find it. it. It looks exactly identical to how you look up events and processors and memories and all the other kinds of handles in Realm. Uh, so. There's nothing terribly surprising there, right? So when you look up a reservation handle, you'll get a reservation impl. Uh, and in particular, like, you know, a reservation has a concept of an owner, right? So just like, just like, uh, well, I should say a reservation impl has, has a concept of, you know, the node on which it was created, but then it also has a concept of an owner node, which is the node that's currently has the valid metadata for this particular reservation. So. This reservation owner, right, effectively has a node ID, which is tracking which of the nodes in the system, right, currently has the valid metadata for this particular reservation. Now, initially, this is on the same node that creates the reservation, but it's possible that this might actually migrate around uh, around the system, and we'll see. We'll take a look at, at how that happens. Um, in particular, there's there's also going to be information about you know how many local you know people are holding this reservation, uh, what mode they've acquired it in, and so and whether this reservation is allocated and, and so forth for when you go to look up, you know for allocating new reservations and stuff like that. You also have a mutex. We're going to go look at what these mutex are, but you can think of these you know for anyone who's familiar with like pthread locks and stuff like that, just you know rewrite p mutex for the for the moment as like pthread pthread mutex t. Um, uh, that's not actually how it's implemented, uh, and we will see in this lecture how this mutex is actually implemented. Um, but, but you know, effectively it has the same proper properties where it's going to be, be providing sort of, you know, your standard blocking synchronization for updating the state uh, inside of this reservation impl. Um, Additionally, we have uh, these node, node sets here, right, which are effectively bit masks, which track uh, membership of other nodes, right? And so, you know, your reservation impl also will track anyone else who has requested the reservation. So like say, you know, someone is holding the reservation on, on node zero and node one then asks for the reservation. It's gonna send an active message over to, to node zero to say, you know, hey, please, please send me the reservation when, when you, like I need, I have, I have somebody who's trying to acquire it on node, node one. Node, node zero is gonna say, oh, someone's already got it here, so we can't send it right away. 
you know, please update this uh, this remote waiter mask uh, to actually be able to 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 do the to send that notification over to Node One once the release is done on on Node Zero and no one else needs on Node Zero. Um, in the case of like uh, read-only locks, you should be able to share this uh, this reservation, right? And so you might have multiple remote nodes who are all you know holding the reservation, you know, in a in a non-exclusive mode, and so you want to track you know what other nodes are having that non-exclusive sharing. Uh, of the reservation. So you could actually have like, you know, multiple nodes sharing the reservation with like a non-exclusive uh, acquirer and so forth. Um, and so uh, that, that's most of the interesting stuff. So if you actually go look at reservation impl, um, let's actually look at the uh, lock or the acquire method here. So here's the reservation acquire, right? Um, this is where, where you get the entry point in from, from the user, right? If you've got an event precondition, uh, let's see. Um, then, then you can actually get the. Uh, <coughs> sorry, if the event precondition is already triggered, right? You can go look up the uh, the reservation, and then you can call the acquire on the base simple. We'll look at that in a minute. If it hasn't triggered, right? Then we build one of you know a deferred waiter, right? Which is which is going to be a normal event waiter uh, that waits on the the event to trigger, and then we'll actually do this uh, this acquire call here. And so, if we go look at acquire um, in here, right? This is actually on the reservation impl itself. Right, so here's where you can actually like you know get the uh, get get the uh, you know the local mutex right for actually doing the the update to the state on the reservation object itself, right? Um, and you're gonna check to see like you know effectively uh, the first first thing you want to see is is whether you're on the node which is actually the current owner of this reservation, right? And so if we own the lock, then we're gonna be able to do all our updates you know here locally, but if not, right, we're actually gonna have to you know like do some other work, right? So if we're sharing, we can, and we're sharing and we're updating the same mode, we can like do that locally without, even though we're not the owner. Um, but if we're not the, if we're not the owner, then we're actually gonna have to like send a, an active message, right? And so we're gonna record, you know, where to send the, the request to, which is gonna be the last owner that we know about. Um, and we're gonna set this request to true to make sure we don't, you know, de make sure we deduplicate uh, requests, you know, sending out to, to other nodes for this reservation. And then down here at the bottom, uh, if I scroll all the way down here, here's the active message that you will send out, right? Effectively, if if you actually need to send out a request uh, to to the previous owner node. Uh, one interesting detail about this, like uh, this request here, right, is that you notice uh, where do you go? Uh, here it is. So this line right here is actually a little tricky, right? So you know it might be the case that this reservation has actually migrated several times since you know we last saw it, right? So this owner state, if we're not the owner. This owner object or this owner reference, you know, knowing which node is currently the owner might be stale, and but that's okay um, because effectively, you know, as long as we can forward it to the next to the to the last person that we knew was or to the last node that we knew was the owner, right? Then that person will get this request, and either they will come down this path, right, and be the actual owner and be able to handle the request, um, or you know, they're they're gonna have to be they they'll be able to forward it on to who they they know is the next owner node, right? And so you might end up getting some like a pointer chasing effectively across the nodes, uh, chasing, you know, the current owner of this reservation as it migrates around uh, between the different nodes. Um, and so even so, we don't like go out of our way to keep this owner object uh, up to date, right? Like effectively, it's possible that some some nodes will see the, know about the stale reservation or, or know about the a stale owner for the reservation, but that's okay. There's sort of like a linked list of. Of nodes that you know, active messages will continue forwarding until it actually finds the most recent owner. We'll kind of like be chasing the owner, you know, of this reservation around the set of nodes until it actually finds it and then then handles it. Um, and so to, that's just something to be subtly aware of: is that this owner might be stale. It might not be that we know the exact owner at this time, but but we effectively have a linked list of of, of chains to actually get get to it. Um, yeah, and so like effectively. You know, if we actually are in this uh, this this case right here, right? This is the case, the logic for actually detecting whether we've actually can can get the the uh, the reservation, right? And the cases where, like, you know, the count was zero, which means nobody else was holding it beforehand, right? Or the mode is the same and the mode is not exclusive, right? Uh, then we can we can grab it. Or the, and there's also no exclusive waiters and and uh, pending on this this reservation and and so forth. Um, and so that's the fast path where you can actually get it right away. Uh, and then down here we actually have the cases where we didn't get the lock, 
Right, and there's different modes that the user can ask for for blocking, right? You know, do they want us to block and wait on it? Uh, do they want us to try and do it with non-blocking and potentially like doing some 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 spin waiting and stuff like that? Um, and so we have some special cases for those that I'm not going to go into here, but those are effectively various cases for for when you don't actually get the get the reservation. Um, and and you'll notice that all of these pretty much give back events uh, for when uh, for for when you know you actually got the got the reservation. Right, and then down here you can effectively return once uh, once you get the lock. And there is support um, uh, for poisoning on on reservations too. So like if you a poison event comes into reservation, right, that'll actually just cause it to no up. Um, so just something to, to be aware of there. Um, there's also the unlock or the, the release method, uh, which is worth looking at, right? Um, so effectively, this is the release method on the reservation pull. I'm not going to show you the the base reservation class. It's pretty pretty simple. It has an event waiter uh, and then calls this method once uh, once um, once the event precondition has triggered, right? And what this does is effectively it's going to determine how we wake up uh, uh, other requesters of this reservation, right? Um, right. And so in some cases, you know, here's the sharing case. Uh, we can skip that case. Uh, this is the case where we actually have have a local waiter, right? So we can effectively uh, wake up a local case. And then, you know, if we, we were able to wake up a local uh, waiter for this reservation on this release, then we return right away. Uh, one important thing to recognize about this, this call right here is that there's actually some inherent unfairness in reservations in Realm, right? And so Realm will prefer to handle all of the requests, all the choir requests on the same node before it migrates this reservation to a remote node. So that means like, you know, if you have a if you have like one node that continually keeps acquiring a reservation while another node is, is also trying to acquire that reservation all the acquires on the node that currently has the reservations the current owner right will keep getting will being successful and you could actually like kind of starve out you know acquires on 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 the remote node in that case and you know that unfairness is is balanced against uh, we, we don't see that that starvation in practice very often or really at all um, it's it's often the case that you know it's much better throughput to handle reservation requires locally before you send it to another node because the cost of moving the reservation between nodes is much higher than you know handling all the local reservations first so it's much better for throughput if you can do that so there is some unfair uh, inherent unfairness here and it's you know effectively manifested by this you know select local waiters call happening you know right here before we do any like potentially distributing of this or sending this uh this reservation to a to a remote node to be handled right and of course if we don't have any local waiters to wake up and we still have waiters, right, that's when we actually go and send the the release uh, to a remote node, right? And so here we're going to, you know, update, uh, effectively get a new owner uh, from from the remote waiter mask, right? Uh, get the next one, right? Uh, we're going to save, you know, effectively save our, this is where we like update the owner to know that the new owner that we're sending it to is where we're going to send it to. And then we're copying out all of our data structures. And then we send this active message down here uh, to send message over to the new owner node to actually go and start handling reservations uh, over there to, to actually do stuff. Um, so that, that's an important thing to just uh, to just to be aware of is that, you know, reservations do have that the little bit of unfairness, but uh, their state machine is pretty simple. Effectively, you know, one node is, is the conceptual owner node, but it can move around. Um, uh, and then, you know, you effectively send active messages to migrate the state uh, of the of the reservation around the around the different nodes to handle requests uh, or requires that are being done done on different nodes. Okay, um, so that's reservations. Now, if I pop back up here to the uh, to the this is the user level API, the reservation.h header file. So we looked at reservations, right? They're they're actually pretty straightforward. Um, there's also another class in here. Uh, that users can use for doing synchronization in Realm, which is called a fast reservation. So a fast reservation effectively is, a, a as it suggests, uh, a much faster implementation of a reservation. And there are sort of like two different ways that you can you can use this, right? Um, the first way is to effectively, you know, you can give it, you know, a base reservation, like a like one of these reservations that we we said to implement it with, and you can stick that in there. And what that'll do is effectively allow you to do, you know, uh, effectively equivalence to to acquires like what you normally see as like locks and unlocks or relocks and write locks and so forth on top of that reservation. Uh, but it w it's going to be done much faster, sort of like you know, without having to go through all the machinery of the full reservation. As long as all the requests are coming on this local node, as soon as some remote node 
um, uh, effectively grabs the reservation, then you know your request will slow down and stuff and fall back to the base the base uh, the base reservation object right that's backing this fast reservation. Now, one interesting thing that you can do with this also, and Legion actually makes pretty heavy use of this, is that you actually don't have to give a backing reservation to this fast reservation. And if you don't give it a backing reservation like this, this turns into sort of a local only reservation, right? So this reservation can only be used on this local node, but because it's not backed by like a reservation that could be spanning multiple nodes, Right, but effectively, it it then you know can be used as just like a fast kind of uh, a fast kind of asynchronous lock on this uh, on this local node, right? And so Legion actually does this quite a lot. Uh, this is how we use this is how Legion builds most of its locking primitives are using fast reservations with no backing you know global res reservations uh, for it. So that's how you make locks on like that are that'll just be used on this uh, this local node. Right, and as I said, um, it has standard methods like lock and write lock and read lock and unlock and stuff. And you can also pass in these spin modes, which effectively uh, say, you know, how you want to how you want to block or wait uh, on these things. You can, you know, spin until it's spin or spin for a little bit of time. That's sort of sort of implementation dependent. You know, spin forever until you actually get the thing. Uh, you can block waiting for it, um, or you can do an external wait if you're doing this call from like a remote remote thread or something like that. Um, and yeah, and there's some try locks and stuff like that. Um, one other thing that I will call your attention to down here is these two methods, um, which are actually quite important uh, for users to actually make sure they use. And we're going to look at look at these just a little bit. Um, and and what they are is effectively, you know, if you're going to wait uh, while holding a reservation, um, what you probably want to do is you probably want to you know, for all these guys that are, for all the other uh, uh, threads or tasks that are trying to actually acquire this reservation, right, like you don't want them necessarily spinning, you know, for forever while, you know, you've gone to sleep while holding this this particular reservation, right? And so if you're holding this reservation, right, you often want to notify Realm that you, you're, you're going to actually block waiting on an event while you're holding this reservation. And so if you do that, it's, it's recommended, you don't have to do this, um, but it's recommended that you know you want to effectively call this advise sleep entry and advise sleep exit, which effectively says you know before you block waiting on the, on an event in in Realm, if you know you're holding one of these fast reservations, call advise sleep entry on this uh, on this reservation and give it a user event that you're going to trigger uh, once um, once you're actually you know done 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 waiting on the event. And and then when you're uh, when you're done you, you know waiting then you can click advise or, or you, you call advise sleep exit right and you trigger your user event and that will actually wake up any of the other things that are trying to acquire this reservation but the, the other things that are acquire, trying to acquire this res fast reservation won't necessarily be like blocked and spinning and stuff they'll, they'll actually go to sleep if they know that they're going to be waiting for a long time for you to wake up from some other event while you're holding this this lock. Um, so just something to keep in mind, like this is something that, that we do recommend that users or, or clients of Realm actually do. Um, and, and Legion definitely does, does this. In fact, I can, I can point you guys at the code for, for where Legion does this, but that's a time that, that'll be another, another lecture at some point. Okay. So how does this fast reservation, uh, actually work? So, um, this is going to effectively be, uh, like a, a very, uh, it'll have this little, uh, state object down here. Um, and you'll notice that you know one thing that we're going to do here is is we're actually going to allocate you know effectively try to make you know the state for this uh, this fast reservation take an entire cache line right and the idea there is that we don't want to have to deal with false sharing and stuff like that uh, with these these reservation fast reservations because they need to be fast and we don't want you know cache coherence issues you know with multiple threads trying to grab this fast reservation to be causing causing too much contention and stuff like that or having having aliasing for multiple reservations or fast reservations on the same cache line or or anything like that. So, so effectively, you know, there's some there's some trickiness here to make sure that the state object here uh, is going to be big enough to uh, to actually fill up a whole cache line and be aligned on a cache line and and so forth to make sure that we're 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 good for that, that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, let's actually go take a look at um, let's maybe look at how lock actually works in here. Okay, uh, so lock is actually pretty simple. It's calling calling write lock, which is not too surprising. So here's write lock. So there's effectively a lot of this is going to be done um, with uh, with with C++ standard atomic, um, right? Effectively, we don't want to back onto actual 
you know, expensive locking infrastructure and stuff like that, unless we really, really, really have to. And we're going to look at how that some of that works here uh, in just a bit. Right. So, you know, there's some fast cases here where effectively, you know, if you can grab this lock, just doing a, a compare and exchange, you know, effectively saying, you know, the old state, you know, zero, which means that nobody effectively has this, uh, has a state and we're going to make the new state, you know, a writer state. Right. If you could do that with an atomic compare and exchange, right, and it's, you know, there's a little bit of like static branch prediction here with this macro realm likely effectively saying, you know, that we expect that this will be the common case that you actually do uh, do hit the hit, you know, do are able to succeed in doing this compare and exchange, at which point you've gotten the lock. Right. And you can return a no event saying you've already got it and you're good to go. Right. But if there's, you know, ex exceptional conditions, then we're going to go into this this right lock slow. Um, so let's actually go look at look at right lock slow and, and you will, we're, we're going to potentially return an event uh, from that saying when you actually get the fast reservation. Oh, let's see. Where did my reservation pull? Here we go. Right lock slow. OK. All right. So here is right lock slow. Um, and there's all sorts of tricky stuff going on here. So I'm not going to be able to cover this in like full detail uh, here today. So the first thing you do is you get, you know, reference to this fast reservation. This is a little bit of type punning stuff, safe type punning stuff. I'm not going to show you this. You can go look at this get FRS static method here uh, that effectively, you know, extracts a reference to this fast reservation state in a way that's C++ type punning safe. Um, uh, but effectively, this is getting reference to the fast reservation state. And if we go look at this, let's actually go look at this fast reservation state before we go through the rest of this method. That's actually defined in this, uh, this class here. Let me actually go to the top here. We'll search from the top. Make sure we find it. There it is. Okay, so this is the fast reservation state. This is effectively what this uh, this like the state in this uh, fast reservation object can actually be converted to, right? Um, so effectively, you know, there's a pointer to the backing reservation um, if we've actually got one, right? This might be null in the case where there is no fast no base reservation implementation, right? Uh, there's one of these mutex classes, which again I promise you we will go look at before this uh, this session is over. Um, but but you know for now think of this as as a p third mutex, which will give us an actual like uh, mutex for for handling stuff, right? Uh, this is a, a ready event, you know, effectively for when pending reservation for when this reservation has been given out, right? We've got a list of the number of of sleepers that are that are, that are you know uh, waiting on this or waiting for this uh this this fast reservation. Uh, we have a sleeper event to notify them, you know, once uh, once they're ready to wake up. And we've also got one of these conditional variables to actually do stuff. So, you know, this fast reservation state is effectively tracking the state for this fast reservation to be able to handle, you know, read and write lock uh, acquires uh, and then being able to wake them up uh, once, uh, once, once they're actually ready. So let's go back to write lock slow. Right. And there's effectively going to be, you know, sort of two cases here, right? There's going to be a, again, there's going to be a fast path and a, and a slow path, right? Um, so this first one, right, is effectively the fast path uh, where, um, or actually, I should say, this is actually the, the slow path where, where you know, effectively, where we've, our state is currently in the slow back or, or the fallback case where we actually need to go to the base reservation class and actually try to do the, uh, the, the acquires uh, using the, you know, the base reservation implementation. Right, um, and so there's a little bit of checking here to update the state, and then eventually, you know, we actually do end up doing this call back to the base implementation uh, to do the acquire, right? And of course, if that fails, then you you have to potentially go back around the outer loop that, that's calling this right lock slow if if you're in a spinning mode. Um, uh, I asked Sean actually one thing I was unsure about is this failed retry count, uh, which is up here. Um, one thing that's going on here is like you actually don't want to to migrate you know this fast reservation if you know that they're pending you don't want to migrate the backing reservation in the case that the fast reservation is still trying to do acquires right like by doing these write lock slows or 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 read lock slows right because the the reservation object itself doesn't actually know about the fact that there are these fast reservations trying to grab it right and so in order to help make sure that it doesn't migrate there's a little counter here that effectively gets updated you know, whenever we have a failed, you know, local read lock or write lock slow, um, and that, that will prevent this reservation, you know, from migrating before all these acquires are, are have actually succeeded. Um, so, so a little exercise for the reader to go look at, you know, or for the listener to go look at, you know, how that actually works. Um, but that's that's what's going on here with these uh, fallback retry count uh, uh, summations here. 
it just kind of this is kind of like just will block all reservation migration, you know, for these backing reservations until you know all these relight re relock and write lock slows have kind of drained out. And again, that's the inherent unfairness of of, of reservations. Now, in the case where um, where you know we effectively are are in the fast path, right? We're not in this slow path here. We're still in the fast path where we can try and do stuff with like standard atomic operations, right? Effectively, here where is where we're going to try and go around this this uh, this loop here. You know, trying to grab the lock, you know, using an atomic, right? So we effectively load the current state uh, into our local, onto our stack. We can then do some checks on the local stack. We try to compute our new state uh, to make ourselves a writer, right? Uh, and and then, you know, we can effectively try and, and do a compare, compare and exchange, right? To put, you know, to, to make sure no one else has jumped in here and changed the state without us uh, interfering. And if we can do that, right, we effectively become the new writer and then we can return. Otherwise, you know, depending on whether we're spinning or whether we're going to be blocking, we do some different stuff, right? So in the case where we're spinning, we update the state, you know, to effectively record the fact that there is a, you know, somebody spinning to try to do a writer waiting, right? And you kind of reflect that in here and then you can, you know, do a pause and then continue to go back around the loop and keep spinning until you actually get this thing, right? Um, in the case where, where, you know, we're not going to spin and we're actually going to try and block, Right, then we're gonna, you know, grab the, the the mutex here, right, and actually do something atomic, right. Um, we can actually go and update, you know, the the state here to actually check to see if you know someone has actually released it, right. Uh, and, and well, here, okay, so there's a couple cases here. The base reservation still holds the lock, right. So like in that case, we can't do anything. The base reservation is still doing stuff, and so you know, add ourselves to the waiting list. Right, uh, here's someone else, uh, you know, still holding the lock, right, uh, at, at the same level as us on this fast reservation, in which case, again, we add ourselves as a, as a sleeper, right? Um, in this case, you know, where we're back to normal readers' rights, we don't sleep, we'll just keep trying to spin for a bit until we actually find it, right? Um, uh, and, and we can go back around this, this loop, right? Um, uh, and eventually, you know, we get down here, all right, and we can actually like, you know, uh, decide what to do, whether we're actually blocking, waiting on the event to wait for, or whether we're gonna keep spinning and, and looking for stuff. Um, and so eventually, you know, when this method returns, you know, either you've got the lock and you've returned with a, a no event, or you've returned an event, you know, in the case where, where you know, you just want an event to wait for um, uh, to say what to do. Uh, there are equivalent methods down here for try lock uh, and so forth, and and, I think there's yeah there's also read lock slow down here which are which are quite similar to these other ones right uh, there's some subtle differences um, the state machines for these are pretty sophisticated uh, so be careful if you're going to be going to be monkeying with them or trying to add a new state um, but but uh, they're they've been working they've been banged on pretty hard at this point um, they also get checked by thread sanitizer and stuff like that so like all these you know uh, read these load acquires and, and store releases and stuff like that are all being checked you know by 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 thread sanitizer to actually make sure that like we're actually uh, actually doing the right things for for all these cases um, so so uh, just have to be careful careful with um, uh, when you're when you're messing around in this code um, there are lots of various interactions between the reader light the, the read locks the write locks uh, you know the the, ba the backing reservations uh, and so forth okay. All right, so I did promise that we're going to go take a look at these uh, these mutex objects um, because even though I said to think of them as p thread mutexes, they're not actually p thread mutexes, and I want to talk a little bit about why that is. Um, okay, so right, let me actually just point you just to remind you where we are. Where was that uh, fast state or fast reservation state? Let me grab the one at the top of the file here. There it is. Yeah. So pretty much everywhere in Realm, you'll see these mutexes. And I think I've mentioned a little bit about like using uh, auto locks and stuff to wrap these mutexes to actually acquire them and stuff like that. Um, but Realm, Realm effectively rolls its own mutexes. Um, and so let's actually go take a look at, at, at those, right? So this mutex class, which actually provided atomicity for us like in that, that write lock slow method, right? Is actually, you know, implemented directly in Realm uh, for, for doing different things. So there is this mutex.h uh, header file over here. Um, and this actually is where all the different kinds of mutexes are in Realm. You can see Realm actually has three implementations for three different kinds of mutexes. And we've tried, we played around with various different implementations of these things and swapped them in and out. Um, importantly though, only one of them, they all have the same interface. So like if you look at all these, like uh, there, there's, 
There it is, that's a mutex checker. Uh, let me actually find the mutexes themselves. Let's see, there's the unfair, here's the unfair mutex right here. Um, so you see it has a lock, try lock and unlock, right? And there's also, you know, internally, uh, or internal methods. Similarly, there's the FIFO mutex, which has lock, try lock and unlock. And then there's the kernel method, which also has these. So, so these, all three of these, these, these mutex classes have the same interface, so we can swap them in and out. And you can actually see Realm up here actually sets, you know, has this little macro here where you can you can play around with the Realm default mutex by setting this this macro here. But if you don't set that, and I don't think it's set by default, right? Currently, right now, we have our default set to this this unfair unfair mutex, right? Um, and so this unfair mutex, right, effectively, uh, actually, I should point up here. Right, this unfair mutex effectively is going to provide, you know, uh, standard mutual exclusion, but it might be a little bit uh, unfair in terms of like not making sure that you know things are given the, the mutex in the same order that they've actually requested them in. Right. Uh, on the contrary, like this FIFO mutex, right, actually will make sure that you know whoever the oldest waiter is, they will be the next ones to get the the mutex uh, uh, after the previous you know previous uh, user of the mutex has given it up. Right. Um, and so. That gives you fairness, but but fairness is not always the best thing for for throughput. Um, and so you know, again, we tend to prefer throughput. We tend to optimize for throughput in Realm, and so we we you know the current default in Realm is this unfair unfair mutex down here. Um, you can also use this kernel mutex, which is actually a way of like you know sanity checking stuff. Um, it will just back onto whatever your kernel based uh, you know system call level mutex that your OS provides is, um, uh, and so like. Uh, we, we don't really recommend that, um, but, uh, but you know, it's certainly there for debugging and stuff like that in case you ever want to do it. Um, and yeah, and so you, all you need to do is just change this, uh, this macro in here uh, to actually change your kind of mutex that you're, that you're actually using if you want to try, you know, if you want to do performance experiments, you know, with fairness and stuff like that, you can swap in uh, other kinds of mutexes. And this will apply across all of Realm, right? So like pretty much everywhere in Realm that you see a mutex, it is this kind of mutex, right? One of these three things, right? And so this macro, just by changing this macro, you can change the, the mutex kind uh, that you use anywhere anywhere inside of Realm. Okay, um, since uh, I, I'm not gonna show, show you how the FIFO or the kernel mutex work, uh, we're just gonna look at the unfair mutex um, since that's the one that's actually being used right now. Uh, and it will show you how some of the base, you know, abstractions and, uh, and stuff work for this, uh, for this unfair mutex. Um, but but then you guys can go you know take a look at the, uh, the the FIFO one and the kernel mutex you know yourselves and and reason about how they work they actually work on some of the same the same stuff uh, same primitives and abstractions and stuff like that okay so let's actually go look at where is the unfair mutex in here okay all right so here's the unfair mutex. Um, Notice that you know we, we have some nice you know support here to mark this. This is not copyable. It'd be very bad if you ever copied a mutex, right? So like uh, all sorts of you know static checks to make sure that you can't can't copy this thing. Um, let's see. So again, same three methods that we're going to look at here. We'll probably look at this lock slow method here because that'll be the act. Well, well, we'll look at lock and lock lock slow because those are actually interesting ones. Um, but you see here, effectively, you know, the main part of this, there's only two two things that are in the state for this uh, for this mutex, right? One is the 32-bit unsigned integer, of which, you know, the, the least significant bit is the bit that's saying whether or not this lock is currently held by anything or not, right? So the lowest bit is 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 set. That means that somebody else is holding the lock, and then the upper bits say how many waiters are currently waiting on the on the mutex. And then in the case that you do have waiters, right? There is this doorbell list, uh, which we'll we'll look at here, which is effectively going to be the list of of waiters that are currently waiting for this uh, for this mutex that we're going to need to notify when we go to to do the unlocks and stuff like that. Okay, so um, if we actually go look at lock right, so in mutex dot inline, um, search for unfair mutex uh, call and lock here, right? So this is the lock uh, call here. Right, so you know, again, in the very, in the most common case, right, this should be really fast, right? Effectively, if the lock is uncontended, right, and you're not actually waiting on the, uh, uh, and no one else is holding this this mutex, right, we can just do a straight fetch and acquire, uh, fetch or acquire release, right? Effectively, to see, you know, uh, whether we can swap the bit bit to one, the lowest significant bit. And if the bit was zero and we're swapping to one, right, then we've effectively grabbed the grab the lock, right? 
Um, and that means that, you know, we were done at that point. And, and again, this should be the likely path, right? And so we set this like static branch prediction capability here with this macro. You guys can go look up what realm likely actually is uh, for yourselves, but I, I'll tell you it's a static branch prediction macro for most compilers um, to say that like, you know, this should be the common case. Um, and and in, in that case, we've grabbed the lock and we're done, right? Um, but in the case we don't get it, right, then we have to go down the, the slow path, right, and call, call lock slow. Okay, and so lock slow is actually defined over here in uh, mutex.cc, right? So if we look for, for lock slow, okay, this is the slow path uh, for, 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 for acquiring, you know, one of these unfair mutexes, right? So the first thing we do, we grab our current state. We're going to go around this loop until we've actually, like, been able to, been able to actually acquire this, uh, this lock, right? So um, in this first case, you know, let's see. Uh, in this case, right, like this is the case where, where effectively the lowest, the least inhibited bit is still one, right? Um, uh, and so what that means is someone else is still holding it. So we'll, we'll come back to this case because it's actually the important case. But there is this else case down here where like, you know, since the last time we tried to grab it with the fast case, right, then, then someone else actually released it, in which case we were able to get in here and actually, you know, uh, see that it's zero. Now we only did a load, right? So we still need to do an acquire release here, right? Um, and, and try and actually, you know, update that state. And if we do, then we're, then we're good. We've effectively succeeded in actually grabbing the lock, right? And, and we can return. Otherwise, you know, we go down here and we go back around the loop and try again, right? And see if we're the first one to, to grab, the, to grab the, the mutex. Okay, now down here, effectively, you know, uh, in this case, we're effectively trying to, to add ourselves as a list of waiters or add ourselves a list of waiters, right? See if we're the next one to, to bump the, 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 the current list of waiters, right? So it's compare and exchange. No, notice that we're adding by two, but because we know that the least significant bit is storing whether the, the mutex is held or not, bumping by two here is actually bumping the number of counters by one, right? So because effectively all the bits are off, off shifted left by, by one bit, right, for the count, right? So effectively, this effectively seeing, are we the next one to be able to add ourselves the list of waiters, right? And if not, then we'll go back around and try this again until we, we are, right? So, so effectively by doing this, right, like effectively we're, we're, if there are multiple people trying to contend to do this lock slow, this is how we order ourselves for adding ourselves to this, this doorbell list, right? Um, now in the case where, where, you know, we effectively add ourselves to the to list, now we, we need to actually stick ourselves in that, that list of doorbells, right? And so this doorbells, these doorbells, the way to think of them is, is each thread or, uh, has its own doorbell. Right. Um, in fact, I can actually show you where that is. I think. Let's see if I can actually find this uh, the thread local stuff here. I think it is here. No, maybe it's over here actually. Let me let me see if I can. Okay, so we're in lock slow. Let's see if I can actually find this thread local doorbell stuff. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So every thread, you know, Rome has this. I don't think we've talked about this before, but but. Realm has this thread local namespace, which effectively stores all the thread local variables for threads inside of inside of Realm, right? And effectively, you know, they track their own their their doorbells, their their own doorbell. So each thread has its own its own doorbell, right? My, my doorbell. This is a pointer to it, and it actually points to here, here's the storage for it. It's not actually initialized yet, um, but but effectively, you know, just allocating a blob of uh, an array of bits here uh, for for actually storing this doorbell, which will then be pointed to once it's been constructed and stuff like that. Um, but every thread has its own doorbell, right? Which is effectively going to be a notification, right? So a doorbell, like a doorbell is effectively a way for a thread to enqueue itself on a list of waiters. And then some other thread can go, go ring the doorbell and that will tell the thread that, you know, whose doorbell was, was in the list to say, hey, you can go ahead and wake up now from whatever you're doing and, and sleeping. Um, so, so this is in, so every thread has its own, its own doorbell and this is the thread local storage that's storing that. Uh, so uh, just to, to, for you guys to be able to see that. Uh, let's see, we want unfair mutex. Yeah, lock slow. Right, so so when we do this, this is effectively getting our local doorbell um, from, from our thread local state. Um, uh, and so you guys can go look up how that does it, but it gives us back a pointer to a, to a doorbell object. And just to show you, there is a doorbell uh, uh, object interface up here. Uh, and this is in mutex.h. So here is the doorbell class. Right, and so you can see, you know, there's some comments here showing, you know, effectively a doorbell is, is used to notify a thread whenever some condition that's been waiting for has been satisfied, right? And that kind of is going to be able to, to wake them up. Um, 
right? And so there's an interface for waiters, right? Effectively setting up their doorbells, right? And there is an interface here for actually notifying doorbells, you know, for, for things that are, uh, are waking things up, right? Um, and there's some, some nuances in here, but, you know, the main methods in here are, are obviously wait and notify, right? Those are the two probably, probably most important ones uh, uh, to pay attention to. Um, we're just going to look at calling those things, but I'll probably let you guys go dig into some of those things uh, in, internally, right? So effectively, you know, we get our local doorbell, we prepare it, right? Again, that's part of that, you know, the, the waiter API uh, to effectively make sure the doorbell is initialized and ready to be used, right? Because we effectively use the same doorbell for, for every wait. So before we can use it, we have to prepare it locally, right? And then we add it to this list, right? This is this doorbell list that exists on this mutex. So just to make this very clear of what's going on, Right, if we go back to the unfair mutex class, right, there is a doorbell list, right? Um, and if you actually, this doorbell list is actually defined in this file also. So underneath of, here's the doorbell class, right underneath of it is the doorbell list class, right? And you can think of this as just a linked list of doorbells, right? You can actually see, um, let's see, yeah, there's this, this pointer here, right? It's effectively either pointing to the next doorbell in the list, Right, or to effectively notify how, how many notifications uh, to do if you're at the end of the list, right? Um, so that's why it's a uint pointer uh, t. Uh, it's effectively doing a, a, a type one union here. Um, um, but effectively, the way to think of this doorbell list is it is a lock free uh, linked list um, uh, for the list of all the doorbells that are waiting on stuff, right? And so it has a method for adding a doorbell to the linked list, which will just kind of traverse the, the linked list um, uh, uh, using a lock, some lock-free code. In fact, I can actually show you that, I think. So I think if I look for add doorbell here, yeah. So add doorbell is pretty simple. What it's doing is like effectively, you know, running down the doorbell list, right? Looking for the next one, uh, seeing if you've made it to the head and trying to append to the, the head of the list. Right, and if not, then you uh, then you keep traversing, right? And so this is some lock-free code uh, using atomic compare and swaps, right? Uh, to effectively or compare and exchanges to effectively be able to, to to try and add this doorbell to the to the list of doorbells, right? Um, and so I'll let you guys work through all the logic logic for this, um, but effectively that's it's, it's just a, a, a lock-free linked list um, as you might find in like pretty much any kind of C code. Um, so anyway, uh, stuff uh, stuff for you guys to investigate here, but but effectively this adds to this list of doorbells, right? And so popping back here into lock slow, right? Adding to the doorbell, you know, just appends ourselves to the list somewhere, right? So that somebody can can wake us up, right? And then we can call this wait method, right? To actually be able to, to block ourselves uh, and actually block. And then when we return, you know, effectively we get the, the information to say what we should do next, right? Whether we've been able to, to get the lock uh, success, whether we're transferring the lock or we've got it successfully or whether we were canceled and, and, and so forth. Um, so, so this lock transfer tells us the result of this wait. Uh, we won't return from this wait until like something has told us to wake up some other, other notification. Right. Um, and in particular, like just to, to close the loop here, we'll go look at this wait method in a minute. Um, but if you look at like unfair mutex unlock slow, right? Like effectively, this is the part where the unfairness comes in, right? It effectively says, you know, we're releasing our unfair mutex, go through the doorbell list and extract the newest one, right? Whoever was the most recent thing to add themselves to the list and give them the lock next, right? Now, if you're doing the, the FIFO version, you'd extract the oldest, right? And effectively get the the thing that's, you know, the that's the oldest. And there, there's some nuances here, right? There's some, there's some parameters here that you can pass in here to pick out waiters that are currently spinning over waiters that are, you know, blocked and waiting because because it's better to wake up spinners than who are already running than, than ones that are waiting and blocked, you know, asleep and might need to be woken up by the OS and so forth. Um, so, so there's some some configuration stuff here to this extract newest call, um, but you can go take a, take a look at that uh, on your own. Um, but extract newest, you know, is, is where the unfairness shows up. If we had packed, picked extract oldest here, that's where you would get, you know, sort of a fair, a fair mutex, right? Um, and once you've got the doorbell to wake up, right, then you can actually do the, the stuff needed to actually uh, wake it up and, and so forth. Um, and there's some, some extra cases here for, you know, doorbells that are, uh, that have some interesting semantics, but, but this is the common case here. We actually do, do, do this, uh, this, no, this, this uh, notification here. Um, so anyway, stuff for you guys to, to look at offline here, but, but hopefully you get the gist of what unfair mutex is doing. Um, now let's actually go look at doorbell uh, wait um, because there's actually some interesting stuff going on there. Okay, 
Well, actually, so yeah, I need to show you. Weight is actually up here uh, uh, in the mutex. I thought it was up here in in uh, in line. Let's see. There it is. Right. So effectively, you know, there there are some some like uh, some special cases here where we're trying to to signal. Um, let's see. I'm I'm actually trying to page this back in myself here. Uh, yeah, I think there's a little bit of there's an extra case here to try and handle um, handle cases where the doorbell gets woken up right away. In some cases, um, I will actually need to check with Sean on this to actually try and remember exactly what's going on here. But um, yeah, I think you know ultimately we we might like in the worst case we end up coming back into this wait slow, which is what I really really want to show you guys. Um, right, so this wait slow. Right, this is where we actually end up needing to either go to, to, to spin or to end up going to going to sleep, right? Um, so, you know, we do, okay, yeah, so I think this is what's actually happening with this, this state satisfied stuff. Um, right, effectively, we don't want to, put, putting a thread to sleep is actually an expensive thing to do with the OS, right? And so we don't want to necessarily put this thread to sleep right away, you know, waiting on this doorbell. So often, so Realm sort of has a little bit of uh, intermediate state here to actually track, you know, where this thread, you know, should spin for just a little bit to see if something comes along and wakes it up right away. And if not, if it's been waiting for just a little bit, then it will actually say, okay, now it's probably worth it uh, to actually time out and and go to sleep. Um, and so there's these these sort of these these states here, like, you know, sleep immediate means don't even bother doing the wait, just go to sleep right away. Sleep never means you're going to spin forever. And then there's also like this, uh, there, there's also these intermediate, you know, uh, sleep sleep states where, let's see if I can actually show them to you here. Where are these doorbell sleep states? Right, yeah, so effectively, and here's where you can actually see Realm sort of defaulting to waiting for about 10 microseconds uh, for a thread to, to try and, uh, to try and, and spin for a bit. And if it hasn't, you know, sort of, if its doorbell hasn't been notified within about 10 microseconds, that's the current threshold where Realm will say, okay, now, you know, this thread has been spinning for 10 microseconds, at which point I'm actually going to, going to put myself to sleep and therefore, and therefore be, and, and therefore actually like uh, preempt the thread and allow, allow the OS to, to put it to sleep, right? So, so just something to be aware of is that, you know, uh, these doorbells can, can be controlled this way. But they, there's also this like sort of heuristic threshold that Realm is setting here to make sure that threads don't just immediately go to sleep right away. They spin for a little bit and then they, they go to sleep. And you could actually probably play around with this parameter a little bit. Be curious to see how sensitive are like different benchmarks are to, you know, for if there's lots of lock contention, you know, how, how sensitive they are to this this sleeping parameter here. Okay, um, right. So so what this this state is doing is effectively doing the the pending wait, right? Trying to spin until we've you know either. You know, never go to sleep, or or until we've we've hit the threshold of of the sleeping time, right? But eventually, you know, you do get down here to the the code path. Like you've gone around this loop enough times until you've either you know you're spinning forever, or you're or you're you know you've exhausted your your timeout right for sleeping, and then you actually do need to to go to sleep. And this is the part where you actually see you know the OS specific code uh, in Realm start to start to pop up. Realm hides a lot of the details of of you know actually doing these sleeps. But you know, ultimately, you do have to at some point, you know, tell the OS to put this this thread to sleep, and we do that in different ways here uh, on different OSs in different ways, right? So, you know, in the first case, you know, this is effectively the the this is the case where you're on Linux, right? And you don't have a we're not using Futexes, right? And so effectively, there's actual raw system calls here, uh, right, uh, to actually be able to tell tell the OS to actually put this uh, put this thread to sleep. Right, so this is calling the the the, the Futex directly, right, doing a system call um, uh, to actually put this thread to sleep. Uh, if you're on Windows, right, Windows has its own own synchro, uh, own uh, properties for putting a putting a thread to sleep, right. And then this is the case where uh, this mutex is actually backed by uh, by like an actual pthread mutex um, and can actually you know put itself to sleep using a, a backing pthread mutex, which does a little more stuff in user space before actually potentially calling a calling a, a few texts and so forth. Um, so, so yeah, so you can actually look, this is one of those places where like, you know, the OS specific code in Realm does tend to, to pop up when you actually get to the very bottom of this, like uh, this mutex acquire stuff or, or, or yeah. Uh, so, so this is where to come look, you know, if you're doing OS specific stuff and wanting to see how, how threads put themselves to sleep and, and get woken up and so forth. 
And similarly, you know, you, on, on, on symmetrically, you also get similar stuff here on the notify, right? So like when you actually go to notify, you know, a doorbell, right? The notification process is different depending on which of the different modes modes you're in, uh, depending on using Futexes or or not, and so forth, uh, and so and, and things like that, right? Um, I'll, I'll say this also handles the uh, the macOS case, like the Darwin uh, the Darwin case as well, uh, using pthread mutexes and and stuff like that. Um, I think right now on Linux, though, we default to the syscall call uh, because it's actually much better uh, performance. Like, in fact, we've done all this stuff to do all our user level space uh, before, you know, before we get here. And I think, you know, we don't we default to not using this, uh, this, this Futex right now on Linux uh, because, you know, we've effectively done all the work on our, our side, you know, to do the user level stuff ahead of time. So there's no need to do more user level stuff uh, down here. This is mostly like a path. Uh, for Mac OS, uh, where you know we don't want to implement syscalls for for all the different operating systems and stuff like that. And I'm not an expert on Windows, so you know ask ask someone else uh, who is an expert on Windows what's going on with the users with the Windows stuff here. But um, but but yeah, this is the window Windows notification path here. Okay. Um, so I think I've talked about everything I was want, want to talk about today in terms of synchronization. Uh, this is sort of a, a, a brief, you know, or you know, sort of a, an introduction to all the different synchronization primitives in Realm and how user level synchronization is asynchronous, and and then you know the internal mutexes and stuff are sort of what you would normally expect, but we do our own stuff to sort of make it uh, uh, operating system agnostic, um, uh, and. Uh, I will say a lot of this code is is pretty well tested. Um, it's been banged on quite a lot, uh, and it does get checked by thread sanitizer. But because it's so you know lock free, it's everything being done with atomics and stuff. Uh, just be very careful when you go to mess with it uh, to try and you know update, you know acquire, think carefully about acquire releases and or, or store acquire, load acquires and store releases and stuff like that to make sure that you know you're not giving the compiler the opportunity to reorder loads and stores in ways that are unsafe uh, in this code because it's it's very sensitive to those kinds of things. Um, so with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, we've got about five minutes left uh, before the top of the hour. No questions, okay. I have a question. Sure. Uh, is there a tune, uh, auto tuning opportunity here? Uh, for example, changing the uh, parameters uh, for, uh, to see the performance difference. Has anyone done that before, or is it well, how promising is this approach? Yeah. So I mean, I think there's sort of like two interesting experiments someone could do. Uh, effectively switching out the. Uh, I mean, playing around with this parameter. So there's not a lot, lot of lock contention. I mean, it really depends on on your application, right? Like if your runtime analysis limited, maybe there's and you're bumping up your number of utility threads in Legion to a very high number, you're likely to see more lock contention. At which point, like maybe this kind of thing actually, maybe these things start to matter. If your application is like limited by compute, like, like you're at, you know in, in an ideal world, you're actually compute limited on your application, right? And so you might not see as much as much lock contention. Right, and so then these these numbers don't actually matter all that much, um, uh, and so just just keep that in mind. But if you did want to play around with it, right, trying to find an application that's more that's like right on the edge of being runtime analysis limited, and seeing if like you know bumping up your utility cores causes more lock contention, right, then you can start to play around with some of these some of these parameters. Um, you know, obviously you could play around with this one, right, effectively changing changing your timeout. Um, the other the other obvious thing to try is like. If you switch out, you know, this mutex from being an unfair to a FIFO mutex, does that make any difference? And like, in in does fairness make a difference to the performance of like the analysis and and under contended locks and stuff like that? Um, so, yeah, it's something to that would be interesting to explore. Uh, I don't think anyone has actually. I mean, I know for a long time we were actually using this five. Or sorry, I keep pointing to these things, but I really mean to point to these things. Um, for a long time we were using the FIFO mutex because we thought it was necessary, you know, for correctness, but you know, we've recently switched to the unfair mutex, and so far Legion has been pretty resilient to that, and the Omniverse folks haven't said anything bad about that either. So, like, you know, effectively all of our users so far have been pretty happy with the unfair mutex um, uh, being used inside of Realm. So, yeah. Thanks. But yeah, I mean, if you want to play around with those things, those are probably the two things to to explore. Sure.
Okay, any more questions? All right, so next week will be a Legion week. Um, and then I think I've actually talked to Sean and he'll be able to come give the next few realm talks because they're going to be on stuff that, uh, that I'm not, I'm much less of an expert on. So the next few realm sessions will be, uh, Sean here giving the, giving lectures, but next week will be a Legion week. Um, uh, and I guess we will talk to you guys soon. Okay. Thanks. Bye.